Oh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, it's exciting to hold space today. For, for me, this is my first um, speaking engagement. You know, I don't want to say after the pandemonium, but the first one since we've had a change in the set of history that we're standing on. So I encourage you to take what resonates with you today um, toward reconnecting and recharging. And the topic of siblings definitely falls aligned with this year's theme in the connection of what we're navigating. So my name is Lisa Coates. I am currently the director of children and youth uh, with SOAR 365. SOAR 365 is a Richmond-based not-for-profit with a mission of helping children, families, and caregivers live fulfilling life opportunities and engagement. Um, I'm a 23-year veteran special education teacher first-generation college student, and it'll all fit in later while I'm mentioning all this, and finally a doctoral student. Um, I spent a majority of my time teaching special education, but for the most part, I can say all my life, I've lived the world of disability because I have two younger brothers with disabilities. Um, so I'm a sibling, I'm an advocate, and I'm an advocate letter, lover. So in the sake of reconnecting, just quickly turn to your left or right and introduce yourself to somebody so we can start reconnecting and recharging. All right. Well, thank you for taking that time to give me a second to sip water and restructure, restructure my slides. I appreciate everyone's excited. I've had the honor of serving in many different positions along my career. Um, I've sat at tables with policymakers, I've taught. Um, but time and time again, I come back to my why, and that is kids. Um, not only is the experience professional for me, it's very personal. And so I've been very fortunate to have the opportunity of being a sibling with disability because it really has carved out a pathway for career for me that I can see things very holistically from many perspectives. So before we start, I just wanna start off as some session norms. Um, respect neurodiversity, we all are different types of learners and presenters. So however, if you need to fidget, if you need to stand up, you go to the back of the room, I'm completely understanding of that and just respect everyone else's neurodiversity. Also want to make note to respect trauma. Some of the things I may bring up may elicit an emotion of you as being an individual with a disability or being a sibling or a parent, and that's okay. So if, again, if you, know, you need to pull out a tissue or step outside to regain yourself, I completely understand that. And I'll keep myself at times from getting verklempt. Um, this is your learning session. So however you learn, if halfway through this session or 10 minutes into the session, you feel like this is not you know, evoking some learning for you, I respect that as well. I just ask you to quietly leave. And if you need to do that, and I take no harm to that. Um, let's practice equity of voice. If you want to share something, give everybody else an opportunity to share their thoughts and feelings as well. And most of all, I encourage laughter. Um, so there'll be stories that I will tell that I'm going to try to get through without laughing. Because um, we talk about our siblings, there's also stories about funny things that they do. So these are my two brothers, Nicholas and Philip. Nicholas is the one in the flannel. Philip is the shorter one. Nicholas is 40 years old. He was born with the umbilical cord around his neck. So that took um, a lot of oxygen away from him when he was born um, for several minutes. Later down the line, he developed different um, health issues as far as um, chronic asthma and chronic coop. So he spent a lot of time in the hospitals because of his um, medical condition on top of his later on diagnosed mild, mild ID. He had reading deficits, math was a challenge, low frustration because he didn't understand things, very literal. There was one time my dad told him to take the garbage out and that's what he did. He took it out, put it on the front porch. So for him, it was, he had to be very specific, take the garbage out and bring it to the trash can. So that was Nick. 
Philip was a preemie. My mother was 45 when she gave birth to Philip. And he was born four and four and a half weeks early as a preemie. He spent his first month and a half in the hospital. Later on, um, heart defect because of that. And um, also later on in life, we realized he developed a condition called cyclic vomiting, which later turned out to be a connection to his epilepsy. Um, again, to very low frustration tolerance. He as well as my brother Nick spent a majority of their educational career in self-contained education classes because of their ID. Um, all the way through the time they were in high school, but I'll talk about that. So. Early on, I'm being the older sibling, I'm the older sister. They were like real life baby dolls to me. I got to take care of my brothers and change them and feed them. But little did I know until I knew what really my family dynamic was like and what I was about to walk into as a glass child. And if you're not familiar with that saying, a glass child is parents or caregivers who see through another sibling, not of any default of their own. They think they're really strong because they're looking at the needs of the other individuals. So later on, I didn't realize what was going on, like I said, till I go on. So these are my brothers, a little backstory. So when we talk about siblingship, just show of hands, who is a sibling with a, okay, sibling, everybody, okay. Who is a sibling with, um, without the disability, if you mind me asking? Okay. Okay, sibling with the disability? Okay. Who's just a, has siblings in general? <laughs> okay, just a show of hands. So the siblingship is a very unique relationship. Um, it's the longest friendship that you'll have. Um, me, I was the oldest, so I know my brothers their whole entire life from birth, watched my mother have to be pregnant with them. Um, you share a connection and a history that no other body, nobody else has. Um, and when I talk about siblings, I also like to preface it. I know the definition is usually the fact that they are biological, but in this day and age, we also have to think about siblingship can also be other individuals in a young age that live in the household, whether they be stepchildren or a blended family, whatever it means. So the definition of siblingship has also changed um, in the fact that that could be a blended family, it may not be biological, but another individual, a cousin. I have friends that their cousin has grown up with them and they look at them more as a sister or a brother than a sibling. Um, a huge part of my influence and my behavior and the outlook I have on life is because of my siblings um, and what we shared together. Oh, and I should have preferenced. You're probably thinking, because I used to get this all the time. They don't look disabled. <laughs> um, and that was another thing that I'll talk about in a minute. And then also a parent's death also reinforces the bond among siblings. In 2013, both my parents died eight, 10 months apart from each other. And at that time, I became the guardian of my brothers. So that is also a big thing that reinforces that bond. So the lifespan of navigating through life with a sibling with disability will change over the period of time. It can go anywhere from feeling, you know, anxious and unknown to excitement and proud, being proud of them and it changes. And the cycle starting with birth, you know, I, like I said, I watched both my mother, um, you know, go through both her pregnancy with my brother and watch that develop. And what that meant, I was just exciting that I was going to have a new sibling in my life. Early intervention as I'm going to, you know, older, getting to preschool and elementary school for me, well, basically daycare, it was all about me until my brothers were born. Then when I went to elementary school, I definitely knew something was wrong. Um, and the fact that my brothers had differences that were different from me. I remember my parents going to a lot of meetings, a lot of um, letters coming home, which I le later learned that they were IP packets coming home to the house. And a lot of whispers, a lot of tears, a lot of back and forth to doctor's appointments. I'm thinking, what did I do? Why, you know, why don't I have this? What is going on? Middle school for me was extremely tough because again, my brothers did not have the look of being disabled, but they were in self-contained classes. They played football, they, they wrestled. So my friends thought, you know, when I would say my brothers have challenges or they're, they're special in their own way, they thought I was making fun of them, you know, like, but I'm no, I'm serious, they, they have challenges. And it was very hard for me to navigate that as I'm going through puberty and, you know, being in the same school with my brother who is in a, a smaller class than me. And then also getting teachers to tell me, you're nothing like your brothers or my brother's teacher saying, you're nothing like your sisters and what that pressure put on them. 
And then high school and graduation, moving away to college, that was for me um, going away. I felt very bad that I was doing that. Like I felt guilty that I was finally leaving my house and, you know, thinking who's going to help do the projects and study for spelling tests. And because that's what was my job. But it was my chore at night is to help. And then working when I, you know, joined the world of work and knowing my brothers and my parents would rely on me a lot of times to navigate questions. Uh, I've been going to IEP meetings since I'm 11. That was my first IEP with my mother. And then moving into adulthood in 2006, I left New Jersey. That's where I'm originally from. And I moved to Virginia. And I remember the guilt trips that I got for leaving and making decision on my own as a sibling to leave. How dare you leave? You know, your brothers need you. And so that guilt and, you know, just still like, is it, I felt shamed as should I had not have a life, but we'll talk more about this, but just knowing that the lifespan and the, the changes you move in and out of it, I'd say going through the lifespan of having a sibling with disability is very much like grief. It comes and goes, it moves about and you just learn to grow around it, it really never goes away. Nonetheless, my brothers had a life like yours. My dad was a drill sergeant in the army and my mom obviously stayed home and took care of my brothers. But it was very important for them to have their own identity and to get jobs. My brother on the top, Philip, he was a chef. He could uh, follow directions very well if he had pictorial and lots of practice. Um, and he made his way through culinary school. My brother, Nick, on the bottom, he went into the construction field. He took um, 17 times Times, no lie, 17 times past his CDL, but he did it. Um, <laughs> so, you know, with those deficits and he made a life in construction, it was very important for them to um, have their own identity, but also I'm really excited that my parents pushed that, that, you know, made sure that they found their way into a career and to have a fulfilling life because my dad was like, you're not staying home. <laughs> So why do I talk about this and the importance of the sibling experience? Um, it's different for all of us. We each have a different story and this is just mine, but it's to hopefully under help other organizations and school pieces understand the student perspective or the, the sibling perspective. Not once did I ever was asked about things when my brothers had what I would call fallouts at school, maybe a behavior. Um, or when my brother would be rushed out of high school in an ambulance because he had an epileptic seizure. No one ever came to find me and get my perspective on that. And hopefully that you within your organizations or you can start to advocate is to really look at the sibling experience and they offer something to help understand things that from a different perspective. And then to help shape that work of what the lifespan looks like to bringing in siblings and asking their perspective um, to share and even to meet other siblings to understand what they are also going through and navigating. So that professional lens to understand what is going on in their lives and how they can also help families and other individuals. Because I know for me, it was very hard to talk to my parents of how I felt and what was going on. Um, and I wish that that was more given, even though I would go to IEP meetings to help with homework, they always kept me in the dark. So the symbolism of the, the drop in the water, the puddle is just that resonating effect that having a sibling with disability may have on the, in, the individual that does not have the disability. Again, when I finally learned what was wrong with my brothers, the first episode, my younger brother, when he had cyclics vomiting, you know, what was going on and having a seizure. And I think back and at the time in growing up, you know, my mother had sonograms weren't what they used to be, you know, it was like these little flimsy pieces of paper. And I look back and thinking how far we've come with the healthcare system and technology. But just remember feeling that sorrow because I remember watching my mother many times when she was pregnant with my brothers crying like as if she knew something was wrong um, and I would cry too but then I would get jealous and feel like why is they all getting attention and going to the doctor and they get to go to shopping at the five and ten afterward and get a prize for going to the doctor I went to the dentist I didn't get anything um, <laughs> um, and then just those common challenges of distress embarrassment having to explain myself over and over again, um, feeling alone. Um, and so those feelings all went through me and it was very hard, you know, as a young girl to understand that. Um, 
And then, you know, oftentimes my brothers would say to me, what is wrong with me? And I, you know, I really, you know, didn't want to hurt their feelings either. So it's important to know that the psychological effects that an individual does go through, um, no fault to anybody, but it is a real thing that siblings often carry um, with them. So over the years, I've learned to manage understanding my brother's disabilities, well, you know, through my lifespan. And this is just a toolbox of tips that I have come up for myself that, you know, helped me that I like to share out um, with individuals, because for me, it was very hard to explain at times about my brothers because they didn't, you know, like I said, they didn't present as disabled, but, you know, their educational pieces showed otherwise and behavioral things. Um, so these are my tips. Um, I switched up there. So whether you're a parent or a sibling with disability, like acknowledge those emotions. They're real. I encourage families to have critical conversations with their children to engage in those and understand where their emotion is coming from. This was not so prevalent in my house. You know, my dad was a drill sergeant. Why are you crying? You know, <laughs> so it was very structured and um, emotions were really kind of not honored for that reason. Um, engage in appropriate conversations about the disability with your with your siblings, their children on both sides. Um, this didn't happen for me until late in life, be right before my parents passed. They both passed of cancer, so it was we knew it was coming. Um, and you know, my mother hands over literally this box of files of every single IEP, every single doctor visit. And I'm just like, and I knew my brothers had a disability. I was aware they had epilepsy, but I really didn't know the depth sometimes of it until I knew. And I was like, oh, okay. So here they know, here's my good gift. So have those disabilities, talk about the real, you know, what kind of medications they're on and what, it, what are they going through, support groups. I really encourage that because at that time, not only was I navigating then the death of my parents coming over to taking my brothers in, I had this whole thing of medical things to kind of navigate. Um, practice explaining. And I say this because you're going to get questions if you haven't on already. Um, you know, I had to explain why my brothers didn't look disabled and what that meant. Um, in the most safest, appropriate Jersey girl way at times, but, uh, um, explaining without becoming very defensive. So you had, I had to practice what that was going to look like. Now, did my parents practice? No, but um, I wish they did. You know, like I would watch my mom awkwardly in the grocery store when trying to, you know, help my brother count money out and, you know, people looking and she didn't really explain well. Again, choose your battles like any conflict. Many of times I've walked away, not really explained why my brother hasn't been in school for the past, you know, month, um, what that what that looks like and why that's going on. And I just choose to pick my battles and just walk away and not even answer. You're going to have that level with anybody. Um, take a moment before speaking. I've learned to kind of breathe because I do. It's very passionate about me. There's times where I will talk and start crying and, you know, just because I'm so passionate and it does hurt and it's a very personal thing. So you want to defend not only yourself, but you want to defend your sibling like we would if they did not have a disability. So I learned to breathe before I spoke and really just take my time with responding. But one of the things that I did do the most was I learned my siblings' experiences. I like would talk to them about things like, you know, like what part of this assignment don't you understand or, you know, and that's where I think I started forming like, oh, I'm going to go to school. I'm going to be a teacher um, because I just really was able to, that was like, they're like my first classroom, I say, <laughs> you know, understand how they were learning, what was frustrating them, helping them practice with coping skills, because believe it or not, I was using them when they were having trouble, like keeping myself calm. So just learn their experience, like what it was like going to the doctors all the time and, you know, having an outlook. My brother could have had an epileptic seizure at any given time, and that could be, you know, the end. Um, and so learning their experiences and kind of learning that from, but this is just a small toolbox that I have come up with to, um, to navigate through that. So navigating alone. So in... 
August, uh, December of 2020, my brother Philip passed away. He had a, a severe epileptic seizure in the restaurant he was working, fell back and hit his head. Um, and, you know, you get the call and you think it's going to be, you know, COVID. And so at that time, you know, I'm still their guardian, helping them navigate through life from afar, making trips once a month back up making sure their medications were filled, making sure they were going to the doctors because, you know, my brother, Philip at times, you know, he hadn't had a seizure in, you know, six months and he'd be like, I'm cured. I don't have epilepsy anymore. So making sure that their medications were filled, what did the doctor talk about? Still doing that from afar and really helping them navigate. And then in August of last year, August 24th of 2021, my brother, um, had a heart attack at work. He was a construction worker. It was one of the hottest days in New Jersey, but it turned out in the autopsy that he had a heart attack because he had taken the wrong medication that morning. So again, these are things that I thought about growing up. Like I know how hard it is to navigate, making sure I take my multivitamin every morning. Um, someone with an intellectual disability and them living on their own. Um, so did I have guilt again? Yes. I felt like, oh, it should have been me there. I should have been taking care of them. And then I felt all this emotion on top of grief. Like it's my fault. I didn't call them to make sure. And you know, so you go through that um, part of life and then you start second guessing yourself and you kind of relive the cycle after grief. And so the whole lifespan, I, you know, it's, Sadly enough, I can say I know the whole entire lifespan now from birth to passage. It's taken me a long time to really um, get my own identity back because as a sibling with disabilities, my identity became that, making sure that they had their medication, they were going to the doctors, checking up on them. Um, you know, they, they were good looking boys, so they had relationships, but understanding that, you know, they would not really knowing how to navigate life and relationships, what that meant, because I had a hard enough time ordering a pizza you know, on the telephone. Um, so it's come for me as a sibling, it's been very hard because my whole life, when the phone rang, I knew I was going to put out a fire. I knew I had to handle something. I knew I had to help fill out a form, fax it, scan it, get it to the right person, sign off on it. So that was always my job to help navigate that. Um, and so that all went away and it really forced me to like think and focus on myself. Like for many years, I realized I was doing both roles. Um, so it became an absent feeling of not having that. And as much as sometimes it was a burden on me, it also was something that I attached to. I felt valued as a sibling. I felt needed. I felt like I was helping my parents, even though they were no longer there. I was upholding that sense that it was like I was living that honor. So navigating life alone, it has its challenges, but I am so grateful for the opportunity because many, many ways um, in that, whoops, go back, in that, um, my story is my story. And I have learned that you only really truly understand what you experience yourself firsthand. And so everyone, we may have common similarities and we connect, but that is our experience. We were in it and we lived it. And the notion of your perception is your own reality and how you see things. Because living with a sibling with disability, it is a form of trauma and you do react differently and you do um, see things through a different lenses. Nicholas and Philip made me see life through the eyes of possibility because through their struggles in school, um, you know, threatening to drop out in any given day and um, slamming doors because they didn't want to do math homework or understanding um, why a girl may have broke up with them once they realized you know, that they couldn't count change packets on dates. Um, they still, they still went on and they lived a great life. Um, you know, I, I would go to bars with my brothers and hang out the way they were able to drink. They were 21. There was no one, you know, so I still had those sibling experiences with them. Um, and, but they saw it through the eyes of uh, opportunity and they both had this attitude that I try to adopt through my life. They just were very carefree and they lived in the moment. And my brothers would say, yes, I struggle with this, but 
nobody else can make a chicken parmesan like me. And they were right. <laughs> so those things that they connected with. But I share my story and, you know, throw in some tips in there that, you know, it's it's a it's a longevity process. It has many perspectives, not only just on the family, but as a sibling. And where we stand, because in the, the majority of the time, 25% of individuals with disabilities wind up living in the household with their families afterward. And then I'm sure if there's parents in the room or caregivers, before you lay your head down at night, I'm sure not that you're always thinking of it, but it's always in the back of your mind. Who's going to take care of my child? Who's going to be that person to advocate and navigate their life for them? And I felt that way. And I wasn't, um, I wasn't a parent until I became my brother's guardians, but I always was their sibling. And I thought about that. Like, should I drop out of college? Should I do, you know, cause I wanted to be there, but I'm glad I didn't, but I know that is something, the longevity and the lifespan of living with a sibling with disability and creating those lifetime opportunities for them to be able to engage and to just continue to be advocates for them and, and, Courage. My brothers were advocates as well. And there's one thing my dad did teach them as a drill sergeant was to, you know, have those skills that are needed for you to be independent as much as possible in life. And that's getting a job and having those experiences like a life like ours. Every individual can work. I'm a strong proponent of that, being able to work and get a job and whatever that may look like. For me, it's a 40 60 hour work week, um, you know, Monday through Friday, sometimes grinding on the weekends. But for my brothers, yes, he was a chef and he worked three days a week for four hours a day. But that's what he that was his least restrictive. And he worked. He went to work. He wore his uniform and it meant something to him. My brother, Nick, he was in construction. Did he he worked five days a week for three hours a day? But that was his job. And they were able to do that. And that's all they could handle. But they were contributing to that work. So I encourage you as a sibling, um, if you're a sibling that has um, another sibling with a disability to encourage their dreams and work with them on that. I know my brothers were very supportive of my endeavors and share your story with each other, share your stories with your parents and your caregivers, because it's very important that that conversation is had. I wish my parents would have had that conversation earlier on with me. But through the years, I've learned, you know, and navigate it. Would I go back and change anything? Absolutely not. Um, because now I can sit, I stand up here and present what you should be or trying to do. Um, but I know we were out of here, but we're, I'm usually the last, I'm the last session between here and dinner. Um, but in closure, like I said, siblings, it's a, it's a special relationship. And to honor that, um, those experiences and to hear those experiences is important. And it does come with a sense of emotionality for the individual that doesn't have disabilities. Um, oftentimes, you know, I feel that it's helped me to be um, more empathetic. Um, it's helped me to see a different perspective. Um, it's definitely created me to be very tenderhearted, which I try not to be <laughs> because I'm always, you know, you want to see the benefit of the doubt and but you still have to set those boundaries. Um, but in the end, like I said, I would not have changed anything. And I'm so honored to be able to stand up here and present on this um, and kind of give them, I know they're watching down, but their experience has also now, they're passing on a legacy to help others in their sense of what it's like to live with a disability because I'm sure their presentation probably would have uh, been more comical and filled with more curse words to mind. <laughs> they, yeah, of what it was like. Um, and you can, oh, my, that's supposed to be an L up there. If I'll put this more up toward the end for um, to reach me, but final thoughts from, I open up the floor at this time um, for final discussions or thoughts. Yes. You stated something I never heard before, the glass child syndrome. So one of my children is that child. So how did you, growing up, having brothers that had 
um, require lots of time and attention and stuff like that. How did that affect you and how did you kind of compartmentalize and not get that, you know, get you down or, you know, make you feel like, oh, I'm not as important to them? Great question. Um, so for me, I wanted to be the perfect little girl. I wanted to make sure I wasn't upsetting my parents. I was doing everything right. I was helping with the laundry. I did everything. Oh, <laughs> see, I'm not talking about you. <laughs> um, but I also was an overachiever. I absorbed myself into sports, cheerleading, academics, every science fair, I was winning first place. That's what I did. I just threw myself into after school activities and that was my escape. So not only that, like I just wanted to achieve and do really well. And, um, you know, some of that trauma still resonates into my adulthood as well, but that's, that's what made it for me. That's how I, I coped. So I just didn't want to make any mistakes and cause any more trouble to my parents or cause another meeting. Yes. Were you, were, were you, were you good in school? No, I actually wasn't good at school. Um, I, school was hard for me and I still think um, not up until maybe a year ago, I was diagnosed with ADHD. I thought it was just grief and trauma from dealing with my life. I probably could have been a neuroscientist now that I'm on Adderall, um, but um I thought it was anxiety of just growing up and trying to be perfect. So no, school was a struggle for me. What I had to do to get an A would take me weeks. I remember crying and studying and figuring out my grade point average to make sure I kept you know, the A plus. Um, I had difficulty um, paying attention. I was very fidgety, but now looking back, you know, and it probably was overlooked in school because I had brothers with, I was always just that nervous kid. Um, and so- so I overcame it just by compensating and studying. And then, you know, um, I did not get into, it's a story, I did not get into college the first time. I barely broke a thousand on my SATs um, just because my, I didn't want to ask my parents to pay for another thing. So I just like sh took it once, showed up, you know, I had no idea there was like a big, it was a thing, but um, I eventually got in. I, you know, I appealed it and got in because I was a very, I was academically on paper. I was wonderful at testing and all that. So it just took me a lot longer um, to study and um, do things, but thank you. But yeah, so school wasn't easy for me. Yes. Could you explain that class? Sure. Um, so, uh, and there's a lot of research on it as well. And there's some great TED talks about glass children. So glass children is just a, um, a phrase that's used for individuals, for siblings that have a disability or live with someone that has a chronic health condition. And they say glass because you can, they are often thought that you see through them because you're trying to take care of the individual that has the more significant needs. And it comes across that glass is supposed to be strong, but at any minute we can break. I mean, I remember taking a shower and crying after my brother had um, a seizure and then watched my mom. And so I kept it together very much so because I didn't want to feel like causing another burden on my parents. And plus in my family, growing up with a drill sergeant father, it was very regimented, you know, he thought he could, you know, box, you know, get out my brother's epilepsy or make my brother smarter. I'm like, you're not gonna change their IQ. But anyway, um, so that is what it's a glass child, child's, um, the phrase comes from. Yeah, just trying to be as strong as they can be. But then being that transparent, you know, like knowing glass, yes, it's very strong, but one little ding can shatter the whole thing, it can come down. But yeah, there's some great research on it. And like I said, there's some really great TED Talks about glass children given by siblings. Yes. Uh, first six years of her life, constantly sick, always. Um, and I was having to wait in the waiting room for the occupational therapy, counseling, physical therapy, speech therapy. I had to get dragged along to all of these different things. But my parents also worked really hard to find adults and adult siblings to people who have disabilities to see what they're experiencing. 
And generally speaking, if there were so small, the child who didn't have a disability felt very ignored and often had sense with their sibling or their parents followed the information into the person who didn't have this and just kind of left the sibling with a disability out to your eye. Um, my parents worked really hard to try and find ways to make sure that didn't happen to me and my sister. Um, I actually started gymnastics classes when I was two and a half because my mom wanted something where Brittany would have to wait for me instead of me. <laughs> I love it. Um, and they push me. I think they succeeded. Um, I think I'm a little bit overprotective of my sister, and if you say anything horrible about her, I will thank you. <laughs> yeah. I think I have my mom was learning to say that what she was talking about. Mm -hmm. Any other final thoughts? Yes. I know you probably talked to a lot of different families. I was wondering if you had any experience with almost the opposite situation. You talk about um, siblings, including blended families. Um, experience where um, divorced families will marry, and, and so suddenly you have kids maybe who don't have experience with, uh, with people with disabilities. Suddenly, put into a situation where they're having to kind of learn all of that, what, what would be life experiences for those of us who have spent our lives with some with a disability and, and running into some of the same issues that, you know, being the class sibling, being, you know, maybe not having an inherent understanding of what that, how that disability presents itself. Um, are there, do you, are there strategies or there um, ideas on how to, how to, 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 to soften that, that's, sort of inherent conflict. Yeah. So I will preface, I'm not here to give dating advice. Um, but when that conversation, as you start, you know, engaging in those relationships with someone that does have a different disability, you know, a disability and the family's going to be blended, those so that same, you know, toolbox of um suggestions would definitely, you know, have that conversation with the individual. Um, you know, I'm not like saying everyone's relationships are different, but to understand and have those powerful conversations, those critical conversations, if you see it going into a blended family situation um, and what that means on both sides, because even though, like I said, they're not, I said, siblingship doesn't have to be biological. It could be a blended situation. Nonetheless, they're still growing up in the same household. They're going to have some experiences. So therefore they are a sibling. But to have those critical conversations, you know, uh, my, like I said, my family did not, we didn't have family meetings and talk about things. My dad was a drill sergeant, you know, you go push it out in the backyard with the lawnmower and that's how you get over it. Um, but I wish they would have had those conversations and had those things. So that's something to put out there to a partner or, you know, and then vice versa for children. I would definitely, you know, have those experiences because at the end of the day, you are going to be blended. Yeah. Anybody else comments? Yes. Well, thank you. Always. Yeah, I, you know, I deal with a lot of things through humor. And so like when my, like I said, my parents passed, I did not um, inherit a house or a boat. I got my brothers, <laughs> you know, and I laugh, as I said, I, cur I told you to earlier today, I have my courage laughter. So sometimes I have to, you know, but, um, you know, I did have to navigate that in life, taking care of their estate and then also then inheriting my brothers. But um, my parents did the best they could at the time they could. I mean, things have changed so much. And parents, I look back now, I am not a parent. Um, I'm a former cat mom. Um, so... <laughs> But talking with parents and been in this field, working with families, um, I, I admire people who have children. Um, and, then, and then even more so parents that have children with disabilities, because that is the pressure on them as well as parents and thinking, you know, you're, that's what you try to do. You try to do the best you can. And then when you have a child that comes into the world that has a disability, you know, that totally changes things. And then navigating life my parents, like I said, they did the best they can. They did not know about a lot of things. Um, and that's why I forged my life into this career is to help somebody like, you mean you know about this, you know, but how many times I talked to parents are like the DD what I'm like, you don't, you know, like, 
So those things like back then, you know, it was very hard. We didn't have the internet. When my brothers were born. Um, you know, you went to the library and you looked in the yellow pages. So those resources are very important. And like I said, so for parents, you're doing, you know, my parents did the best they could for what they knew. And um, I'm glad for that experience um, to be able to like now share my information with families and caregivers so they could get those resources. Anybody else? Question? No. All right. Well, thank you so much for letting me um, take the time to share my story about my siblings today. And like I said, I hope you each go out and are an advocate for the work that we do um, and share something that you learned from my presentation today. Because like I said, that little ripple, one little rock can ripple and make a big difference. So thank you.